it's useful for crypto users to to use a VPN. And so that was one of my yeah. ideas, but we sold before we got around to doing that. It. That that would have been cool if you would have done that. That would have been a, that's a pretty cool move. Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's up? We got John Coogan here. Uh, John, somebody who I only know through a lunch at a uh, Mexican restaurant in LA, and that's the best way to meet anybody who's going to be a podcast guest. So, uh, you you got a crazy background. I'll give people the rundown if they don't know who who you are. So, you've uh, been an entrepreneur your whole life, never had a job. Started two companies that were both really interesting: Soylent, which was basically making a uh, a meal replacement drink, is the easiest way to explain it. Tasted like the milk of Honey Nut Cheerios, which I always appreciated. And then uh, Lucy Gum, which was like a nicotine gum. Both of them went through YC. Together, they've raised over $130 million. A bunch of good lessons there. Um, you're also an EIR at Founders Fund, which is one of the more interesting places to to kind of hang out or be a part of. And uh, like us, you've made the mistake of leaving entrepreneurship to just be a YouTuber. And this is great. So you know how to make content too, which is, which is amazing. You make really awesome videos uh sam was sending me one this morning sam you like his stuff huh i love it yeah i like your stuff john i uh by the way Sh sean i'm an investor of lucy so i gotta get that out of the way and probably but, a user too uh, at one point for sure but i mean i think you did invest like four years ago so uh, you know the fact that i haven't been on yet i think i earned my stripes by posting on youtube playing in the content world you know what is your guy? I don't even know. Can you say what the valuation is? I think I invested twenty five thousand dollars at a ten million dollar valuation. And ten, yeah, you were probably in like the seed round, and now the company's worth like sixty, seventy mil. All right, I've, on paper, I've made a little bit of money. <laughs> yeah, not bad. We had, I think we could tell the story. We had one of the other co founders of Lucy come on the pod once, yeah. and this guy, we had met him at a at some like event, maybe a hustle yeah. event, so some some nighttime event, yeah. and this guy was holding court. That was Dave. Dave, yeah, he was telling stories. There's five people around him. He's got ideas. Uh, you know, he's like, oh, there needs to be something called Pleasure Island. And it's a place where you can just go sin. And I was like, wow, who is this guy? What is he talking about? And he's telling stories. And he's amazing. Everybody's just in, in, in captured by this guy. I'm like, we got to have this guy in the pod. He comes on the pod, tells none of the stories and none of the ideas. He's like, nah, nah I don't want to tell all those on the pod. And we were like, dude. And so I don't even think we ever ran the episode because he refused to tell the good stuff. So John, will you make the same mistake as your pal? Absolutely not. I mean, I, I, I do think a lot of founders have a ton, just a ton of scar tissue built up from like the last 10 years of like the media just going after tech founders and like tech bros, programmers. Like it was really aggressive for a while there. Like anything you said would be like taken out of context, totally. putting some clickbait. But now that Elon bought Twitter and kind of just like caused enough chaos, like you can just say whatever you want. And there's like no, I, I, I've been telling every, every founder I know, like cancel culture is over. Like, don't worry about things. Just say whatever you believe. <laughs> so we're going to do some of your philosophy. Okay. Some of the, the philosophies like cancel yeah. culture is over. But first, let's yeah. run through the background here because both of these startups, normally we try not to spend too much time on the guests with the background, but yours, both are so interesting. Um, can yeah. you just tell us, uh, you know, give us the origin story for Soylent because when this came out, it was a very different idea than anything I was seeing anybody do in Silicon Valley. Nobody was... At that yep. time, this was maybe 2012, I had just moved to San Francisco, yep. and uh, you had kind of like Uber and Airbnb, but very few people were in the in the San Francisco venture community were doing like like a like a drink or like a product that you could eat, you yep. could drink, um, that wasn't software-based, and but still was innovative. And so it was like kind of in, in this mix, and I remember Andreessen Horowitz got behind it and some others, and so it was a very interesting thing, and I think it started out of like a hacker house, right? Like you guys had a crazy house. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, a bunch of funny stories from that. This was the, yeah, Warby Parker was like the first e-commerce company to kind of think about it from like a tech first angle. Uh, we were a couple of years after them, um, right around the same era as like Dollar Shave Club, if you remember that company. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we met in a hacker house. Uh, my my co-founder and I, we went to preschool, middle school, high school together, went to college in the same city. And so we move out to Silicon Valley. We're looking for a place. We find something on uh, like Craigslist. It's like an Airbnb listing. And they're like, this place is incredible. It's got a pool. It's got five bedrooms. It's exactly like the social network. You're going to love it. We show up. The pool is filled with algae. The <laughs> bathrooms don't work. 
it's just absolute squalor. So we grind for like six months there. Eventually, we moved to the Tenderloin, which is an even nicer community. <laughs> and and uh, we're living in technically a one bedroom with three guys. So I was living in the living room. An- another guy, uh, Rob, the guy who actually came up with the idea for Soylent, he was living in what was technically a closet because it didn't have a, a window. And we were just we were just hacking. We were just not a lot of dating going on. Yeah, not a lot of dating. Um, <laughs> Not a lot of anything. Just wake up, program, go to sleep. Wake up, program, go to sleep. And we just had a, sticky notes on the wall being like, okay, after this idea fails, we'll build this next idea. All all the worst ideas you've ever heard on here where people come on and they give you their bad ideas, like like we were building them all and they were all failing. Give us a couple. What were they? Like take a picture and it puts it through a filter and it puts it on a shirt and it like mails you the shirt. Like it's just like weird <laughs> stuff like that. There were some ideas that were good. They were just like way before their time. Like, uh, do you know Google Stadia? It allows you to play video games in the cloud, streams it to you. Like we basically built that, but it was just like five years too early. And also we didn't have a trillion dollars of data centers for free like Google does. So it like, and even Stadia, I think failed. So like even Google couldn't pull it off. And so of course we weren't going to be able to get it done. So there were just a lot of those ideas where it was like too early, wrong team, bad execution, or just terrible go to market. Like there were some things that we built that were pretty good, but it just didn't work. And and living with Rob, living with Rob would be odd because I know Rob. He's a, he's a he's, yeah. he's so unique and eccentric and weird and in such an interesting yeah. way. Yeah. So he'd been writing on his blog and posting on Hacker News, and he wrote a bunch of basically viral clickbait targeted at programmers. So he speaking of dating, he wrote a uh, a, a blog post saying how he hacked Tinder. And, and he was saying this was before like bots and stuff. So he basically claimed he didn't really do this. It was more just like for satire and for fun. But he said he wrote a script that would automatically swipe right on everything. And then, and then generative AI talked to, this was like 10 years ago too, but like talk to the, (laughs) talk to the person. And then it would use the Uber API to call them a car. And then it would order DoorDash and deliver the food. And so like the, the punchline at the end of the, at the end of the story was basically like he wasn't involved at all (laughs) because it was like, you know, you can, you can imagine where that goes, but basically he had, he'd built a little bit of a following on Hacker News. And so when the the question was like, we like building these software companies, we like coding and building stuff, launching businesses, but we are going to run out of money and we're going to have to get jobs. So we need to look at our expenses and understand where are we burning money. We paid our rent a year in advance. I think we were paying $1,500 for three dudes to live in the heart of San Francisco, like crazy low money. We owned our laptops paid our internet bill. Like there was really no cost other than food. And so figuring out how to get food as cheap as possible was like a very logical, you know, conclusion from that. So Rob starts whipping up the powders, figures out this meal replacement. He's like, instead of buying a cheeseburger over here or some groceries over there, let me buy a 200 pound sack of protein powder. Do do you remember that first conversation when he's like, guys, I got it. We'll just Get a bunch of powders, yes. and then that'll be the food. Like, is that? Yeah, is that literally how? There it was? were two. There, there were yeah. There were two phases. The first phase was he told me like, oh, I'm 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 doing this diet experiment. I think it's going to make me healthier. I'm going to you know monitor all my macros and micros and start working out and get in shape. And I was just like, who cares what we look like? Like, all the only thing that matters is like our code and like our business ideas. <laughs> like, we don't we don't. Which is very stupid because obviously you do need to be healthy to like be productive. Um, so that was a stupid take by me. Um, but I kind of wrote it off and then he kept doing it for a few weeks. And then we were at a, like a dinner with a friend. She'd made like homemade sushi. And it, I mean, that's like a treat when you're broke. And he was like, no, I'm not going to eat. I'm on this soylent <laughs> thing. And I was like, this is crazy. It's so, I mean, it's sort of like the Brian Johnson before Brian Johnson, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the stress test. So basically uh, he told me that I was like, do you have a name for this? And he was like, I'm calling it Soylent. And I knew the reference. And I was like, this is genius. We need to sell this today. Like this is like, like this is going to be the market entry strategy. It's going to be so viral. But yeah, I mean, he basically did a stress test. He lived on it for 30 days. And then people would just be like, yeah, I, I think this ingredient is stupid. Or I think this is bad. But like, hey, if you survived 30 days <laughs> only on this, like I can probably take a sip and see how it tastes. And so it created this curiosity. When we launched yeah. my content company, The Hustle, one of the first early viral video, uh, viral you, uh, articles was I paid a guy two G's to live on it for 30 days while he was running 70 miles a week as like a amateur wow. runner. Yeah. May he rest in peace. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> it's like he dropped dead on day 15. <laughs> and, that, and that's what made the story go viral. Well, yeah. The, the, the storyline thing, that was the gift that kept on giving particularly, I mean, for me as well, you know, like I, I, I got traffic from it too. Yeah, and, and it was it was like a left right issue. Everybody hated it, uh, and then you'd post it, and then this was back in the day when like the Facebook algorithm was like entirely comment driven. So people would correct us, and they'd be like, "Oh, you made a mistake. You name you accidentally named your company after a movie with Charlton Heston in it. That's a sci fi movie." And it's like, no, obviously we did that on purpose. Like, what are you talking about? But that the fact that there would be that comment and then another co- person would come in and be like, oh, well, there, there's actually this book. And somebody would be like, oh, you need to fire your marketing people. Be like, oh, I actually got the reference. And then they'd be talking every single time we posted anything in addition to all the comments about, is this good? Is this bad? What, what does it mean for society? So just massive viral fuel. Any, any article went viral. And so we were able to kind of trade up the chain and go from Vice News to, you know, The Hustle to BBC to the New York Times, New Yorker. And then eventually Rob was on the Colbert Report with sitting next to Stephen Colbert. It's crazy. Well, it it's definitely shows the power of a viral product, but also it was my first time learning about Signal. So like I had never bought a fancy watch or a car or jacket or anything, but the first time I was seeing you holding a Soylent, it was like this crazy signal was going out to the world. It's like, I'm in tech, first of all. You know that just by this drink. You don't have to ask anything else. All right, maybe if you looked at the brown guy in San Francisco, probably would have guessed that one. Okay, what <laughs> what else does it tell you? It tells you, like, I value productivity. But yeah, brown guy, it's Soma. You know, yeah, like, my backpack yeah, is, like, yeah. sagging to the back of my knees with somebody, like, <laughs> yeah, accessories yeah, yeah, in it. Yeah. So, so then it's, like, number two is, like, you value productivity over yep. things like taste, maybe even things like health, right? Like, Oh, yeah, everything. Yeah, 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 for So sure. it's, it's a value signal. Then it was like yep. a contrarian signal. And it was like, a, I don't give a fuck yep. what you think about me signal. It was so powerful yep. as a signaling tool yep. for like this one year period. Yeah, but that actually cuts both ways. Because food is such a signal and there's so much badge value, it's very hard to accrue like monopoly power. And how do you actually go about disrupting Nestle if it be, if every if every food is like an extension of personal expression? It gets very hard because as soon as everyone is doing one thing, I'm going to want to do something different. And so there's this constant like ping-ponging in these products. So it's very, very hard to create like one brand to rule them all. You said something about Peter Thiel uh, <laughs> talk to me and for one in one hour he diagnosed everything that would go wrong in my business was that about Soylent yeah what did what did Peter tell you yeah I mean we went in for like the pitch and sat down and did like kind of a working session and uh, I mean now everyone knows the framework because he's written the book zero to one it's in, it's like incredibly popular everyone kind of knows that you know the the way venture back companies accrue value is through moats the development of moats and you know the Hamilton Helmer has the powers framework. Peter has, you know, different, um, d- different theses around this. And, and we know the basics. It's like, you know, brand, intellectual property, complex coordination, scale economies, network economies, right? N- network effects. And so, but at this time in 2013, everyone thought that there would just be a magical network effect that would show up. And that's just not true. Like, so there was this weird dynamic where, you know, a lot of investors that we talked to were like, oh yeah, like you don't need to advertise. You can just like, like the people like it so much that they'll sell it to each other. And that's true in a multi-level marketing scheme, but it's not true if you don't build that infrastructure to make that happen. So we never, we never achieved like escape velocity there. And he was just kind of like, yeah, like this is just a widgets business. Like run this like a, you know, any other business, like you need to sell, like you have product market fit, which we did. Like you just need to maximize, you know, your, your, like, like run the playbook of, you know, market, bring the customer in, make sure you're bringing them in cheaper. He, He was basically like, this is a great lifestyle business guys. Congrats. And and then we raised a bunch of venture and it was a disaster. What was your peak? What was your peak revenue? Like almost a hundred mil, almost a hundred mil. And um, I was reading you guys sold it recently, and uh, yeah, not a good outcome. <laughs> all right, I was gonna, I was gonna say, no disrespect, but the outcome sucked. Yeah. Like for for how compared to the hype and your peak revenue, I think it was like yeah. I, it, it was sold by a publicly traded company. Did I read it was sold for sixty million dollars? Uh, something. I mean, not not a lot. I I I I actually like don't even know the exact dynamics because there's a bunch of other like assets that were like rolled up and it's part of this combined thing. But it was like, sold for you know, like maybe like, as much or less than you raised. You raised a hundred million dollars. Yeah, think? exactly. Which basically means like the common doesn't get anything. Got it. So you 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 didn't get much. You you didn't get that wealthy from it. Yeah, we got a decent amount, but not like what we should have. 
you know, if we'd maximize the Got value it. of that company. But then you right. started Lucy. So Lucy is, is cool. Uh, you, are you there full time right now? No, I'm like one day a week at Lucy, um, mostly helping out with stuff like this, doing content, and then ideally like brokering deals with other content creators. Like we want to do more. We being Founders Fund. Uh, no, no, me being the, the we, we being the Lucy team. Got so it. to give some background, you know, Soylent is this nutrition product. Uh, we run that for four or five years. And then Lucy is a uh, nicotine gum brand and nicotine pouch brand. So if your viewer, if your viewers are familiar with Zin, uh, you know, we're a direct competitor to Zin, but we differentiate on flavor, strength and a couple other. Dude, I'm a I'm a factors. all day, every day type of Zin guy. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I imagine I, most people in the audience are. <laughs> it's extremely. I just right wish now. that Lucy sold it at Seven Eleven because going to the gas station is like part of my routine. You know, I got to go see my boys there and, <laughs> and hang out. And I, <laughs> I mean, one hundred percent. That is uh, that is the name of the game, and that was what will actually unlock like massive value in the Lucy business. One hundred percent. People should know that, by the way. When you when you email Sam, you're like, "Hey, I know you're a super busy guy, and so I'm going to keep this brief." Sam's busy at 7-Eleven yeah. shooting the shit with his boys <laughs> yeah. on the curb. Those lot of tickets don't scratch themselves, my friend. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's busy, just in a different way than you expect. <laughs> yeah, I, I got to drop off like a pallet of Lucy at that exact 7-Eleven and just be like, here, it's free. Now Sam can get his well, Lucy. You, the, the Lucy things are cool because basically a Zin is just a pouch, but uh, Lucy has, it's called a breaker. And so you like bite into this and you get like a little menthol or something, like a flavor out. I love it. I like the citrus. Yeah, one. it's like a, it's like a liquid flavoring. So yeah, I mean, a lot of people complain that the pouches, although they're they're much better than the pouches of previous years, they dry your mouth out, and that's the number one complaint. So we figured it out. You know, how do we address that? Well, let's just actually take liquid flavoring and put it inside a capsule, then and, and then when you break it, it moistens the pouch and then doesn't dry your mouth out. Gotcha. All right, and let's talk about ideas. So those two ideas you did. I would say are in the like top 1% of weirdo ideas, which means I love it and I love you. Ah. What are your other weirdo ideas that you're not doing? Uh, you sent us a couple of bullet points, but ex explain them. So let's, let's run through some of your ideas. Yeah. I mean, I think the first one that would be interesting to talk about just because, you know, you guys are obviously creators as well is um, just this idea of a creator owned VPN. So we've seen that VPNs are, might be the number one advertiser on YouTube. I don't have the exact stats, but anyone who's listened to a podcast or you watched a YouTube video can probably name five different VPNs. And yet none of them are venture backed. There's not like one or they're not like majorly venture backed. They're not big venture winners. There's not like one that's running away. with. Have them. you researched these guys? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. They're like all in Panama or Moldova, the, the Mald or what's it called? Moldova, like uh, Maldives. I've tried looking them up on... Um LinkedIn, because I went, I did a, lo a ton of research on about this. I, specifically, I did a lot of research on the VPN review website. So there was one called Compare Tech that was doing 14 million in revenue, 13 million in profit. It, like I saw their financials and they sold yeah. to a VPN company. And I was like, these VPN companies are crazy. Uh, but I looked all up, I looked up the employees on LinkedIn and like you can't find their employees on LinkedIn, even though they're companies that are doing $300, $400 million a year in yeah, revenue. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a very, very odd space. And basically, like, there's no, there's no big, like, venture winner. There's no, like, oh, Air Airbnb, we all know the CEO. He's taking the company public. You know, there's no, like, there's no, like, front facing company that's like, oh, this one's winning and going to run away with it. It's more like there's a bunch of them. They all print cash and there's not really going to be one winner because there's no network effect. Again, it's it's it doesn't have a big moat. The moat is marketing, and that's why they all spend on marketing, and that's how they differentiate is just you check all the boxes. How big are they? E easily easily in the billions um, for, for, for the aggregate industry. And like you said, you, you, there's certain that are doing, there's certain VPNs that are doing hundreds of millions of dollars of sales. And so the name of the game is just check all the boxes so that no, no VPN reviewer who's independent can like take you down and be like, there's a fatal flaw and do not use this VPN because I know for a fact that it doesn't do the right thing. But once you've actually implemented all the features where, yes, we, do, we check all these boxes, then it's just a marketing game. And that's why you see them. Is it just a commodity? Like with, with, I, I don't know much about the VPN tech. Like, is it, are, 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 is it terribly complicated? It, it is complicated programming wise. Like it's, it's, it's somewhat complicated to write the code, I guess, but it's not complicated from like understanding the features that the customer wants. You're not trying to create some sort of. And you, 
you called it Beast VPN. So what's your business idea here? I, yeah, I called it Beast VPN. <laughs> I called it Beast VPN because obviously Mr. Beast is the biggest creator and he is an interesting place where he has an international audience. He has a an audience that's it's just it's just everyone. His audience is everyone. And so what's a product that you can sell all everywhere across the world that's very high margin, low churn? VPN. And that's why VPNs are advertising all over YouTube is because it doesn't matter if the ad is served to someone in Japan or India or Europe, like the VPNs available there. So I'll give this idea a nine out of 10. Uh, nice. <laughs> what I like about this Let's idea go. is exactly what you said. It takes the weakness of creator businesses, which is you get a bunch of low value kind of uh, subscribers might be like, you know, some the value of a random subscriber in India or a random subscriber in Croatia. It's like hard to get ad money for that type of viewer. But this product is actually even better for international people than it is for in the U.S. So I think that's one big strength. And then obviously recurring revenue, uh, digital good or recurring revenue software is obviously amazing. I only give it a nine instead of a 10 just because it's the first idea and I, I'm not that easy. So I got to, I got to dock <laughs> one point just on that yeah. alone. Also, to be fair, uh, it might make more sense for like a Linus tech tips and an MKBHD to do this because they're more of like tech people. We were going to do this at milk road. Actually, when we, we built milk oh, road, wow. we were like, okay, cool. We're making money. We were profitable on just newsletter ads, but I was like, What's the best product we could do? I was like, what if we did a crypto, a, a, a VPN for the crypto economy? Cause we're, at that time, we're, you know, one of the more trusted brands. We're like, it's kind of a commodity software. It's useful for crypto users to, to use a VPN. And so that was one of my yeah. ideas, but we sold before we got around to doing that, it. That, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. You should have, that would have been cool if you would have done that. That would have been, a, that's a pretty cool move. Too bad. <laughs> <laughs> well they still the guys still own milk road so I, we, we still own a part of it well, i'm gonna tell yeah. them after this and be like hey guys let's revive yeah, this whole i mean idea. the main thing is that you just have to have the the distribution you've listed uh linus tech tips on your you said do you know this guy well no i yeah. just saw him so you said that oh, okay. uh what, what's the guy's name marquise what's the guy's what's his channel mkbhd yeah. marquez brown Mar yeah i like him everyone knows yeah. him uh he's yeah. cool this guy linus tech tips has 15 million he's subscribers huge. yeah oh huge. my god what and like he, he, i mean he he I, I, he has a team that's like you know i, I think over a hundred people wow multiple channels podcasts like everything he actually built his own like media platform where you can like go in and watch videos and and talk to each other it's like a forum site didn't he's, he just released like a screwdriver and sold like five yeah. million dollars of a screwdriver or something like that yeah i'm sure he, i'm sure he did great on that the question is like would he have done better if instead of buying a screwdriver which needed to be bought probably locally or it was really right. expensive to ship internationally he sold something that was recurring software that was 99% margin <laughs> of VPN. <laughs> the only thing is that like, honestly, the screwdriver is cooler than a VPN. So, you know, I can't fault him because the screwdriver is like, you get to build your hacker, you get to put your PC together. Like that's fun. VPN. It's, it's a little boring. I use a VPN though. <laughs> I like VPNs. All right. What you got? Second idea. Yeah. So, uh, uh, the, Obviously, Americans love guns. You're an American. You own some guns. Uh, that's not changing. We've seen through, you know, the past few decades that, like, like real, like, restrictions on guns are not coming. And so the business is probably pretty durable. We've seen that the, the stocks of munition companies are doing fine over the last decades. Um, but the price is increasing. A lot of that's just due to supply chains, but there might be some more structural issues. Also, just more people are hunting, more people are are buying guns and buying ammunition and obviously shooting. It's just a fun hobby. So the the it, it, over the last three years, the price of shotgun shells went from $10 to $16. Pretty big increase. And there's this massive shortage. So the the idea here is basically like maybe you need a new um, maybe we need to bring some uh, some efficiency to the ammunition supply chain and I think it's an interesting idea. I don't actually know enough about how to run an ammunition depot or an ammunition factory, but what I do know is that the hottest trend right now in business is like roll ups or search funds, and every guy who graduates from HBS is like, I'm gonna go roll up laundromats or I'm gonna go roll up dentists. Dentists. It's like everyone has an idea for these things, and they're all very commodity, they're not very contrarian. And so there's probably not a lot of alpha there. 
But it's like the guy, the people that are coming out of HBS are probably not saying, I'm going to go roll up weapons manufacturers. <laughs> and obviously, like, Anduril is crushing it in the venture side, but they're doing, like, I- insane software, hardware, building drones, building, like, these really advanced AI-powered weapon systems. This is not that. You do this company, you buy a bunch of, you know, all we do is make shotgun shells. You buy three of them, you move the employees around, you kind of optimize things a little bit. It's just like a very boring, like, like you know, private equity style roll up. And then maybe it accrues power over time because obviously it is a massive industry, but you're not coming in and trying to reinvent the wheel. You're not being like, we're going to actually 3D print the shell or something. No, it's just like good operations. There's a lot of gun yeah. YouTubers. You know, we could yeah. we could mix that. Oh, yeah, yeah, we could get them in. <laughs> do you live in California? I do, I do. Are you guys even... So I used to live in California. I live in Texas now. <laughs> I, I own yeah. guns because I have a ranch and it's fun for yeah, shooting. Yeah, yeah. Are you guys even allowed yeah. to own guns in California? Yes, we're allowed to own guns. Yeah. What, no, like, what's the rule? <laughs> uh, no, no, I mean, you can... Th- there's a whole bunch of restrictions on, like, rifles, like, certain capacity magazines. But the I think most recently, like, it's pretty easy to get a concealed carry permit in San Francisco. It's kind of a narrative violation. Wait, what? I, I thought for years that wasn't impossible. Yeah, most people think it's like unthinkable, but in fact, it, it, it is becoming easier, which is kind of crazy. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, California is not like a dream state for, for you know, if you're a gun fan. But <laughs> Sean, Sean, you've been talking about getting your conceal and carry for years now, right? <laughs> no, not, not at all. Um, guns scare me, but uh, I did look at investing in an ammunition roll up. I'm trying to find the the deck. Wait, you right did? Now. That's hilarious. Uh, yeah, we got introduced to somebody who was doing it, and I was like, oh, I kind of wow. love this idea, but it was so far uh, field uh, sure. out of like what I'm used to investing in that I was like, and I, yeah, and yeah, I didn't yeah, know the yeah. guy. It's like, how like, do you know? Yeah, how do you know that they can actually do the due diligence? Like, if you can't do the due diligence, exactly. I don't think I would touch this. I wouldn't touch this either. Why? I wouldn't want this in my obituary that I, you know, even sure. though, and I, and I, and I, I understand how that's hypocritical. You know, I criticize yeah. Sean because Sean wants to like invest in OnlyFans companies and I'm like, I'm not touching sure, that. Sure, sure. But at the same yeah, time, yeah. I consume porn. So like, there's definitely sure, like sure, sure. a little bit of, uh, I, I acknowledge the hypocrisy. There's like cognitive dissonance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But like, you know, I guess, I guess, you know, it doesn't have to be black and white. It's shades of gray. And like, <laughs> may, I, I prefer to stay on the whiter of the, of that side. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's totally fair. And I think that's why there might be alpha in this area, because I think yeah. that dummies like you, Sam, that's what that's where I why this opportunity Ooh, exists, because that made no sense. <laughs> it made tons of sense, dude. What are you talking about? You're like, I love guns. I enjoy them. I buy them. I'm buying I'm buying the ammunition. But, you know, I don't want to support I don't, I don't want to invest in it because only bad people would buy it. Like, what does that mean? No, no, I didn't <laughs> say only bad people. I said I don't want to own it. I didn't say I say that I, I buy the stuff. I use it. I think it's very enjoyable. I love shooting for fun, but that doesn't mean I want to make it my career. I mean, Sam, would would your opinion change if we were actively at in a hot war? Uh, like, yeah, like, my, like, you're, like it's your duty to America to optimize the ammunition supply chain because yes. there are like there, there there are troops from you know some country landing in the beaches of California. Would my opinion <laughs> change? Yeah, of course. And, yeah, and, and that's totally fair. And, and I think that's and, right. And my opinion could change about the whole thing. I'm very open to new uh, totally. data points and changing my opinion. Uh, uh, I'm just saying, like, yeah, like Andrew, like I love Andrew. I, I like. Yeah. I think that's a very patriotic mission. But oh, I know, 100%. owning Remington, like right now, I'm like, uh, I don't know, man. Uh, like, yeah. I could probably make money in other ways, and sure. my conscience would be a little le- less. Like, it would be, a, it's very, it, it's just an easier decision. Sam, I got, I got a question for you. There's a thing going viral on TikTok right now that's uh, g- girlfriends asking their boyfriends or, you know, wives asking their husbands something. I'll be the wife here. I'm going to ask you a question uh, that they're asking. Hey, when's the last time, or how, no, how often? Do you think about the Roman Empire? Anything to do with the Roman Empire? Oh, all the time. A lot. (laughs) (laughs) Like, like, uh, why? Under what circumstances would you need to think about that? Just like uh, like gladiators and shit. Just like (laughs) battling to the death in front of everyone. When's the last time you thought about something like that? Like this week? Last night? I mean, the, the, the funny thing here is that like the the meme immediately before that was like the in the arena meme. And everyone yeah. in tech was posting literal like Roman Empire gifts that's because true. That's true. everyone in tech is like obsessed with the arena. And I know that there are two separate communities. Like that's not why the meme popped up, but it's like. Yeah, it's so funny to see 
all these women are like, they're like, they ask, they see somebody ask the question, the guy answers some exact, almost yeah. like verbatim what Sam just said. Always, like, always. It's like, I'm thinking about it right now. All the time. Yeah. <laughs> like, what do you mean? Of course. Yeah, and then, my wife has a video of that where she, I didn't know about the meme and she takes out her phone and videos me and is like, uh, she how asked you, this? you think about the Roman Empire? Yeah. And I was like, I'm thinking about it right now. Why? How do you know? <laughs> and then all the comments are like, you know, that make, you know, that's crazy. And then they come back, reply like, I just asked. He said last week, he said he thinks about it twice a week. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, and don't, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. lines are being blown. They're like, I can't fathom why this man who doesn't take out the trash on time, who forgot to pick up our daughter from preschool, why he is thinking about the Roman Empire twice a week. Dude, I think about 9-11 and World War II like 90% of my day. Like, the, the, do you guys not think, like, what would I do if I was on that plane? Oh, all the time. You know what I mean? Like, all, all, I think all, about all that time. constantly. I think about yeah. that constantly. Or like, It's just a very yeah. normal masculine urge. It, like, the, there's this joke, Shane Gillis, he's like, just so you know, oh, yeah. being obsessed with history, particularly World War II, is a precursor to becoming a Republican. <laughs> yeah. uh, like, <laughs> it's so, not going to happen so today, true. but like, you know, it's early onset. Right, early uh, onset. Yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, Sean, you don't think about like World War II like on a regular basis? No, but I have my own version of it, which is like, I'm constantly like, I if I walk into a place. I'm like assessing how if I had to, how would I like rob this place? Or like if, oh, if some shit went down, like what's yeah. the move? All right, what's the move? Okay. There's some sort of like masculine daydreaming that happens. Like right. my buddy David, like he he imagines like ninjas coming through every door and window and how he would like take them out tactically. Like that's his Dude, like, every time I'm in a baggage claim, I I'm like yeah. I could take any of these bags right now and just walk out. There is no security in this place. Are you kidding me? Like the, the baggage yeah. claim, I, I will never get over that. Why it's so easy to just take anyone's bag. My wife and I go out to dinner. We have like a rule. Sam's back does not sit to the front door. I have to see no, the yeah. front door. Like, you know, like yeah. I can't have people coming in without me knowing. I, I've got to see yeah, the yeah, front yeah. door. Yeah. I do think it is a man thing. You know, uh, John, we, there's this funny quote Scott Galloway said. He goes, uh, um, you should exercise so you can kill and eat most everyone in a room or be able to outrun them. Uh, <laughs> and that's like at, at its yeah. root. That's kind of like what we're talking about right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. Yeah. It's very natural. <laughs> there. Uh, John, I want to ask you, you, you um, so Sam is basically like clearly just like surging on testosterone. You uh, are EIR at Founders Fund, which is, I remember at one point when they were talking about PayPal, they said, uh, Oh, you know, Max Levchuk interviewed some engineer back in the early days of PayPal. And then he was like, no, no, can't hire this guy. Like, what? He passed everyone else's test. He's like, he plays basketball. I don't know any great programmer who goes and plays basketball three times a week. That's not a thing. And so they were like very anti-jock. Um, do you get to hang out with the Founders Fund people a lot? Like, do you hang out in person at all? And what's that like? Because it seems like a room full of very interesting, very different people. Yeah, it is. It's uh, It's oddly they've done a great job of not creating a monoculture in a very small organization. So yeah, there are definitely like complete jocks that, I mean, obviously we know Keith Raboy is that Barry's like five times a day. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I would call Keith Raboy a jock, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, like, why, but he's why? like a workout nut. He's a fitness nut for sure. Yeah, but Barry's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, he's not trying to be the best at sports. You know, he's trying to be the best at exercise. And why is that okay, guy? Okay. Why? No, I'm just joking. But why is that guy? Why is Keith Raboy such a dickhead on Twitter? <laughs> like, why does he behave that way? He's, he's like needlessly rude. I think a lot of it is just like holding the line on like it, like when he sees something that's like not true, he doesn't want it to spread. And so he just like shuts it down like really aggressive. Yeah, he's like put it. He's like. He's put his flag in some silly things like Miami. So it's like if Miami doesn't work, it it's like going to hurt him. And it's like, you know, it doesn't have to. You know, you, you, you could love it. And also it's not the best. A lot of these things are, you know, I think learned behaviors. I think everyone in tech is somewhat like, like just injured from the past. Like for sure. It's very obvious. <laughs> of just getting like just beat down for everything little thing. And so a lot of people have put up walls. And I think that it's time. I agree with you. I think it's time to kind of take down the walls, be a little bit less defensive generally. But I understand where all these behaviors are coming from. What's Sean Parker up to? We haven't heard about that guy in years. In yeah, we got to get him back on Twitter because if you or X, because if you talk to anyone who knows him, they will just say that he was the greatest poster of all time. <laughs> Who's the best on Twitter now? I mean, probably like uh, 
Rahul, Ligma, Daniel Johnson, like those <laughs> type of guys, right? Like, uh, do you guys remember that publicity yeah, stunt amazing. or that stunt yes. that they did? They fooled CNBC into reporting that they were <laughs> Twitter employees that were fired. It was very, like, that. that's just like, you know. Those guys, um, they're like doing a normal startup. They're like building some oh, yeah, dev yeah, tool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, they're not like comedians. They should have just gone all in on like, oh shit, we need to just create like this sort of like um, some version of punked or like, uh, you know, something for the tech industry. They should have just gone all in as personalities. I would have dropped the startup in like six months sabbatical on the startup. I'm just going to see what happens if I fully troll and like maybe I could be the thing that the community needs. Dude, Rahul Ligma still makes me like spit water out my nose when I hear that. <laughs> it's it's so funny. It's so funny. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, how would you monetize that if they would you just be doing stand ups? I think you would like... get silent donations from billionaires. I've seen that guy, oh, yeah, and he only hangs out with successful yeah. billionaires when I've seen him in person. Like, because everybody who was big in tech loved that troll. Elon loved it. Uh, you know, like the the all in guys are like, oh my god, it's the best. It's the best. I feel like they could have a Patreon of billionaires only that just fund them to like do statement art, uh, you know, like comedic statement art against the media, against the local politicians, against whatever. That's what I would have done if I was them. That's maybe that's not a bad idea, but I don't know. I, I like it seems like they're pretty legit at what they're doing. <laughs> they're like actually good programmers. <laughs> I can't find this client info. Have you heard of HubSpot? HubSpot is a CRM platform, so it shares its data across every application. Every team can stay aligned. No out-of-sync spreadsheets or dueling databases. HubSpot, grow better. You have um, a thing on this document that I want to fight you yeah. about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew this. I was good. You're good. <laughs> the, the, here's the... So John sent us this document. He says, unique philosophies. Lifestyle businesses are worthless. What do you <laughs> make your case yeah. before we make you walk the plank? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I, I, this is mostly just like, let's have a fun debate. Cause I'm like, you know, working at a venture capital firm and I can kind of represent the VC crew and you guys are like the Kings of like the lifestyle business. So we aren't the Kings of that, by the way, I want to be the King of it. Actually. I, I actually will accept that compliment. I, I don't mind being the King of it, but what I'm saying is yeah, yeah. I think that we are one of the very few kind of content creators you, you pay p proper respect to it yeah i what i'm saying is we we, yeah. we 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 do both we think both are cool that that's i th there's very few people i think that are in the middle and i think we are in the middle yeah 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 that's fair that's fair um and so yeah b basically the, i i think the point is just that uh lifestyle businesses are great define that so I would say uh, I would say like non venture backed non blitz scaling non hyper scaling non monopoly something without a crazy moat where it's just like you go and work at it and maybe it gets really big and maybe you wind up being a billionaire, but you didn't, you didn't like do this growth at all costs, insane thing. And what's hyper growth, uh, two or three times a year? I mean, sometimes 10 times a year, right? Um, it depends on the scale at the early stages. It goes really, really fast, but I I'm specifically thinking of like Facebook, right? I'm specifically thinking of the power law outcomes in venture. And my, my point is that basically only about 1% of companies that get started raise venture capital, but about 99% of the market cap in the public markets, they took venture. And so venture has this very like as, like, like disproportional outcome. And I believe that, that the bigger the company, the bigger the impact on the world. And so if you want to have a really, really big impact, you should actually be trying to raise money, grow very, grow very quickly. Like you're not going to build a hundred billion dollar company compounding at 2% a year, 5% a year over your lifetime. It just won't happen. All right. Let me play the other side of that. Please. Your analogy of, well, okay. So you're saying 1% uh, or 90, uh, 99 percent of the value is created by the one percent of companies that raise money. Yep. But that to me is also saying that, like, look, um, one hundred percent of the soldiers on D Day who ended up uh, killing like uh, the Nazis that ended that battle, they had to land on that beach anyway, right? So you might as well land on that beach. And I'm like, yeah, but the other ones got like fucking killed and destroyed. How about I just like not worry about killing Nazis and like I can just yeah. like start this little thing on the side. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> it's like it's like dude, like this whole thing with like VC, it's like you're funding all the uh, you as the investor are yeah. funding all these companies and you're like, dude, I don't give a fuck which one of you dies out here because I know one yeah. of you is going to like make me my money. 
And so from my perspective, I'm like, yeah, so if I can get rich at with a higher likelihood, which is maybe uh, in most cases, the number one reason for starting a business and not most cases, like other cases, it's like the number yeah. three version. Let's say your number one version is like, I want to like create change. Getting rich is still up there. So like yeah. if like if you can get rich and create value and have fun and work for yourself and have a higher likelihood of doing that, why wouldn't you go that route? So so the reason I think you shouldn't go with that route is because I think your overall impact on humanity and society and the world will be lower. If it, if it survives. Yeah, th- th- this whole question of would you rather own 100% of a $100 million company or 1% of a $10 billion company? I don't even think it's a question. Obviously, the $10 billion company because the $10 billion company is having a much larger impact on the world. That qu- that's, that's not an obvious answer. <laughs> but no, 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 it's, it's not. It's not. For, for a lot of people, they say, I would rather have 100% and be able to go on vacation and, you know, chill and just have these cash flows come directly to me and not have to deal with, like, you know, all this other stuff. And I get that. But my point is that, like, I believe that humans have a duty to each other to go and have the largest impact possible. And that is often done with the backing of venture capitalists. I don't think you believe that. Yeah, I do. Wouldn't you not be like uh, curing cancer instead of selling nicotine gum? Like, let's, yeah. uh, let's yes. be honest here. Yes. Uh, oh, oh, I mean, that's hilarious that you use that as an example because that's like the actually the best way to stop lung cancer is to get people to switch, right? <laughs> yeah, but don't let facts get in the way of a good argument. Uh, but, 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 but I, I will actually synthesize this for you, and I think we will agree on this point, which is that what you should actually do with your life is pick the hardest, most interesting, most value creative problem that you are equipped to solve. So can I create a cancer curing drug? No, I don't have that background. It's not an option for me. So I would fail if I went into that industry, but I should pick the most ambitious thing and the best idea that I have. And then I should be very rigorous about whether or not that idea is appropriate for venture capital. And I think that if Mark Zuckerberg didn't raise venture capital, his company would be dead. And I think there's a lot of companies, I've been a part of some of them, where we raise co- we raise VC for, com- for a company that didn't need VC, and it also killed the company, I think. So basically, you have to, you have to pick the best idea that you're equipped to solve and then decide the financing strategy that aligns with that. And there's no one-size-fits-all solution. Do you wish you would have done a different idea instead of Soylent? Or do you wish that you just hadn't taken VC and you got wealthy? Oh, I don't know. That's interesting. I mean, right before Soylent, I was working on natural language generation in 2013, which is like the hottest trend now. And so if I'd probably just like stuck with that for a decade, I'd probably be doing something cool right now, maybe. <laughs> you, I, I think that you would have been more impactful if Soylent has, hadn't raised and you had gotten rich and then you would have been able to like say do like, something else. Well, you would have been like, I don't care about money as much. So I'll just do this other crazy thing that is a moonshot. Like, I, I, I think it's I because I, I took a similar argument as you. Yeah. And then uh, someone corrected me and they're like, yeah, but it's a lot easier to go after moonshot ideas when you don't have to worry about a mortgage. And as someone who had a bootstrapped exit, I agree. I'm like. It's pretty like I understand why founders uh, want to take secondary because you are more dangerous when you have 10 or 20 or 30 million dollars. Like you are more dangerous when you don't worry where you're like, I'm rich enough that I don't have to worry, but I'm not rich enough that I want to stop. Yeah, I 100 percent feel like I'm in that category <laughs> like that. That puts you in a dangerous yeah. category, I think. Yeah, I, I 100 percent feel that I'm in that category. And, and, and thus, because that's true, I think lifestyle businesses are awesome. Oh, because they can get you there faster. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I th- yeah. Yeah. Get like the base hit before you do the big thing. Yeah. Not unreasonable. And and I think that's also kind of a synthesis of what we're saying. We kind of agree, but it, that it's like moonshots are good, but but the path might be circuitous to them. Right. And there are freaks out there like an Elon, like a Zuck. Well, I don't know about Zuck, but like an Elon who's willing to risk it all. Yeah. Even Elon, like PayPal could be framed as like less ambitious than SpaceX and Tesla. Right. It's like the mission might not be as big. Who knows? Well, he tweeted this out the other day. Uh, and so Andrew Wilkinson had had tweeted something out sure. like this that was like, uh, you know, um, you know, learn to learn to crawl or learn to walk before you run. Yeah, yeah, and he's yeah. like, most most people who want to do a big, crazy, ambitious thing should start by doing a smaller thing, so they learn how to do business and then do you know make things happen and then graduate up. And a bunch of people were agreeing with him. I totally disagreed. I was like, if you know the thing you want to do, 
you should just go do the thing. You know, the way that doing something before you do your bigger thing works well, I believe, is at first, that was the biggest thing you knew. Yep. And then as you did it, your worldview expanded and your ambition expanded and your exactly. the set of possibilities you were aware of expanded. And then you went and did that thing. However, Elon did reply almost uh, confirming what Andrew had said for him. In his case, he was like, yeah, you know, I couldn't have created SpaceX if I didn't have the money and the skills and reputation as I had during Zip2. And specifically, somebody had said that like, they had talked to Elon and he, you know, I don't, I don't believe this for the, for the record. I don't believe a word of this, but they were like, yeah, I talked to Elon early on and, or I talked to Elon and he said that early on he decided, oh, I want to die on Mars. Just not, he, he said the following, I would like to die on Mars, just not on impact. Um, and you know, that's like his joke. And then he's like, and I decided the way to do that was I needed a lot of money. Um, and so then I went to the internet just to go get the money quickly, you know, as quickly as I could. I don't believe that to be true because, um, you know, first of all, not everybody is like that much of a mastermind. Yeah. You know, when he was like sleeping under his desk as like a college kid, I don't think that he was like being like, I'm only doing this so that I can amass a fortune to launch three spaceships, uh, you know, to be able to fund three of my own ships. Like, I don't believe that. Yeah. Also, he went and did X after Zip 2. So it's like, oh, if you already, you already had, you know, whatever, the, yeah. you know, I, I don't know what he netted. I think like some like 60 or $80 million out of Zip 2. Um, like, I'm, I'm, it'd be surprising to me if he was like, you know what? It's not going to be enough. I need to go get to 250 million. That's the magic number. Yeah, there's a big question about yeah, like like should you ever sell a company? Because if if your real goal in life is to have an impact on the world, maybe the company is the best way to do that. And right. so you should just continue to run your company endlessly. I mean, you guys, we, we, uh, everyone on this call sold, sold well, companies. Well, my goal is very simple. Yeah, well, well, yeah. What's your goal? You said like if you want to have maximum impact on the world, that is not my goal. And so it's very easy for me to just be like, oh, cool. I can rule that out. I'm trying to have the best lifestyle that I could have. That is my selfish and very transparent goal. I am trying to improve my quality of life. And with yeah. that comes my family's quality of life. With that might come living yeah. in a good place and being being a happy, content person walking around the world is my contribution to society. I don't feel the obligation to go save the world, but personally. I mean, the beauty of that is that like by you will naturally have a positive impact on the world by doing what you do to achieve those ends. It might not be as big as, oh, you got us, you cured cancer, got us to Mars, but like there's going to be economic activity that provides value and utility to various people as you like go of about course. your business. And as long as you have like a moral compass that doesn't, re that doesn't result in you doing something really unethical, like you'll probably have a net positive view on society. Like my, my trainer has a great way of saying this. He goes, uh, you know, we, I was like, yeah, my goal is to like have an amazing lifestyle, quality of life, right? That's my, my number one, like, you know, why I do things is around that. Does this improve my quality of life? Oh, if I go do this thing, I'm stressed out all the time and I have meetings all the time and I don't see my kids. No, no, no. You've, it is not improved my mm. quality of life. But he said, the other, the other thing he said is mutually beneficial so that all the things I do are mutually beneficial to the people that interact with us. If I make yep. a product, it needs to be mutually beneficial to them. If I have a partner uh, or I interact with somebody, it needs to be mutually yeah. beneficial. And so that's the only caveat that we added to I it like to that. make it, you yeah. know, work. Is your personal trainer like your life coach too? <laughs> yes. Awesome. Oh yeah. That, that's like a, that's a recurring theme is Sean's personal yeah. trainer. John, you, uh, yeah. you're cool because you, um, I think you're like us, uh, but maybe even more extreme in the tech world in that you have your foot in the startup world and you're hanging out yep. with these big wigs, but you're also can just joke around and shoot the shit and like you're yeah, pretty yeah. self-aware who uh what do you align with who do you align with politically oh uh yeah i i really like this guy mark hurd who's a republican from texas uh he was uh he's a smaller candidate so he's not polling super well but he worked for the cia and he also was on the board of palantir and he would be the first computer scientist president. And I think that that would just be very, very interesting to see someone with a CS background. Obviously, I love programmers and I, I think that they think about the world in very interesting ways. And we've had this very long, long arc of, you know, lawyer, lawyer, businessman, lawyer, 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 right? Like that's the story. And he's like a younger guy. So uh, I'm, I'm proud to endorse him. Are you more Republican than Democrat or do you vote both? It, yeah, yeah, I vote both. It just kind of depends on who is who. Who can have like the highest impact on mostly technology and the business community? I think that those are kind of the the the, the things that we need to be thinking about. I do think there's the interesting um, 
as I look back on Trump, I didn't vote for him, didn't support him, voted against him twice. But um, but I think that there's this weird s- situation where like the problems that Trump brought were obviously really bad. I think he really like divided the country and just created a lot of chaos. And I think that was like probably net negative for the United States. But he did kind of get China right. And he started this like he got people waking up about the fact that we are in a great power competition again. And so you could see a world where the China situation dissipates and things get better. And that would be phenomenal for the world. And that's what I hope happens. And in that case, Trump will be remembered as like an idiot, basically. But the opposite could also happen, where the China situation gets hotter. And then people look back to Trump as like a like a genius who foresaw this all and like took the first steps to like make things safe. And so I think the what's interesting is that the, the way we remember presidents is often not by what they actually did, but by how their decisions look in hindsight. And it comes back to the, you know, don't judge a venture investment until it's 20 years later, 10 years later. It's the same thing. It's like, like maybe we shouldn't judge our presidents until we, you know, with the full history of time. You had said something earlier about like you were working on natural language generation in 2013. Yeah. Um, now these large language model LLMs are all the rage. And you had an idea around this that I liked because it was very different than how most people, most investors talk about this. So you had yep. said something like everybody is um, knocking certain AI startups because they're, oh, it's just a wrapper on top of GPT. It's just a wrapper on top of what OpenAI is doing. It's, it's a flimsy little thing. You had a different take. What's your take? Yeah, my my take is that that might be a reasonable critique for a growth stage venture capitalist to debate with their partners at an investment committee meeting. That is not necessarily what we should be putting out on Twitter or X to the next generation of young builders. And if you are, you know, I, I know a lot of these kids who are 17, 18, 19, and they're hacking and building chat GPT rappers, and some of them are making a ton of money <laughs> and it's fine. What's an example? Yeah. Like, I mean, like an example would be like, um, like just, just narrowing down to something very, th- there are a few people that have done like, uh, like almost like dating coaching kind of like, uh, to help with if you're bad at texting. There was a whole South Park episode about this where it's pretty funny. It, Yeah. Yeah. Like if you're, if if you don't know what to text someone on like a dating app, you can have like, you can go to ChatGPT and say, hi, I'm on Tinder and I I need to send a response to this girl and I'm feeling awkward. Like, what should I say? And it'll give you a recommendation. But these apps have kind of like fine tuned it to be a little bit more like spicy or, you know, engaging or whatever. Homework help. They'll do rap lyrics. They'll do whatever. Right. Yeah. And I, I, I don't, I don't know the details about those, but a lot of people will be like, oh, those aren't appropriate for venture capital. Therefore, like they should not be built. And this is kind of where I'm flip-flopping to my, you know, lifestyles are bad. It's like, no, actually these are phenomenal because we need these, these like people to get experience building. And I think maybe I think about it even less from the economic side and more from just the experiential side of like, if, if you ever talk to somebody who's like, they were able to, you know, run some small business when they were in high school that's always a bull signal for entrepreneurship. Yeah. Like there, it's always like, oh, you're and now you're doing the venture back thing. It's going to make a lot of money. Like it doesn't matter what the thing was, right? right? It's like, oh, I was hustling sneakers or, oh, I was like selling, reselling uh, concert tickets. Like my thing was I bought DJ equipment in the United States and then I would export it to Australia. And I was just like hustling that stuff in high school. Like everyone has one of these stories. I'm sure you guys have tons that you've told on the pod. Um, but so, so basically with the, with the, uh, we need, I want the Lenza for chat GPT moment. So Lenza, for those of you who might not remember was, I don't know what that is. So, so it's this app that you would download and you'd upload, you know, 10 f- selfies of yourself from your camera roll. Yeah. And then it would generate AI images that looked like you. So it would be like, it, that looks like Sam's face, but it's on yeah. Superman or it was like, but it was really like a Russian company that was, that was the rumors that it was a Russian company. I don't was, think that one was, but yeah, I mean, there are some weird, like these apps come from all over. I'm not sure about Lenza. Um, I, I think I don't, I, I, I just haven't looked into the company, but, and it made a bunch of money. It was like number one in the app store for a bit. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was based on it was based on Stable Diffusion, which is this open source software package, and Dream Booth, which was this paper that Google put out that then people went and implemented. Like no one knew what those things meant. No one, your aunt doesn't know what Stable Diffusion or Lens or Dream Booth is, but she probably downloaded and paid for Lens uh, Magic Avatars and had that as a profile picture for a little bit. So it was just like this this fun viral moment that was really successful. And I think that there's a lot of people who I would hate if they're toying around with chat GPT and they don't build something that's really fun and cool because they're like, oh, well, this won't be like a hyperscaler combining like generational company. It's like, maybe you just need to go build the fun thing and put it out there and see how it goes. What, what would be something you build? So I have an idea about this, which is basically that um, there's a few things that these, that these uh, systems are really good at. You know, obviously there's been huge progress in helping software developers program with GitHub Copilot, which is, you know, built by OpenAI under the hood. There's also, you know, just the Google use case. Like I go to ChatGPT all the time and just ask it questions that I would normally ask Google. Um, people are doing a lot of like AI girlfriend stuff. Like, you know, Sean, I'm sure your your next uh, your next big uh, OnlyFans investment will have an AI component <laughs> probably. But but I think that the that, that one of the interesting things that these language models are particularly good at is something called the Barnum effect. Have you guys heard about this? No. So the Barnum effect is this psychological phenomenon where like I can say a, like something that sounds like it's very specifically tailored to you, but it's actually vague and applies to everyone. So, so an example of this would be, um, Sam, you have a great need for other people to like and admire you. You have a tendency to be critical of yourself. You have a great deal of unused capacity, which you have not turned into your advantage. Like these things resonate with everyone. They certainly resonate with me. I feel like, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> but, and they feel personalized. It's like astrology. Yeah, yeah. They use this in astrology. And so what I'm thinking is like someone should take the, you know, chat GPT LLMs and make some sort of like viral personality quiz, viral astrology app, something along those lines that- Miss Cleo. Yeah, that, ex, that, that exploits this effect that LLMs are really, really good at. And then, and then uses it. It's just like, yeah, you, oh yeah. Did you get your personality? It's like, did you get your lens of magic avatars? Like, yeah, I got them. Like I had to do the in-app payment. It was five ninety nine. dollars It's like, oh, did well, did you get your custom personality test through this chat bot that's new and going viral? Like, yeah, sure. I did that. I think that's a great prediction. I think that's going to happen uh, very soon. And this, we'll look back at this clip and be like, dude, he called it. John called it that <laughs> that was going to happen. I love it. it has to happen. Uh, somebody said this the other day. They go, um, they showed me, oh no, they showed me a Steve Jobs clip. And Steve Jobs goes, once this technology happened, um, yeah. the, there was a set of 20 things that were going to happen no matter what. It didn't matter who yeah. was going to do them. They were going to happen. A series of events were going to unfold once that breakthrough, once that first breakthrough happened. And you just didn't know when and you didn't know who, but you definitely knew that they were going to happen. That's how I feel about this idea. I love it. I'm glad I, I'm glad I got the thumbs up on all my... All my yeah, your ideas were, were actually very, very, uh, very, very solid. You you said you did your high school flipping thing. Uh, you also were a uh, uh, what was it called? Like a, a phone, a, I was telemarketer? a telemarketing scam artist. Telemarketing <laughs> tell, scammer. tell that story. We'll wrap on that. Th so th th this is a phenomenal story. Were you like workaholics? Uh, yeah, yeah, a little bit. I I use the office as a reference point because that is the the default like small business in America. Um, you know, they make a thing and then they ship it out. And so the scam worked like this. I found the job on Craigslist. I show up and I'm wearing a suit. <laughs> I'm probably 17 years old or something. And I'm like, I brought a resume. I want this job. And they're like, uh, it's not that type of job. Like you do not need to be wearing a suit. Just sit over there. You're going to call these numbers, call down the list. And when they pick up, read this script. And the script goes like something like this. I probably still remember it by heart, but, um, it was like, uh, when they pick up, you do not ask how they're doing. You do not talk to them. You just say, shipping department, please. And you want to make it sound like you've been disconnected. Like, I was already talking to the shipping department. Half the time, people are like, what are you talking about? This is a law firm. We don't have a shipping department. But the other half of the time, people are like, yeah, we got a shipping department. I'll transfer you down there. <laughs> like, you must have just gotten disconnected. Then you're down in the shipping department. So imagine Dunder Mifflin from the office. You know, you just talked to Pam. Pam transferred you down to, I think, Daryl is down in the shipping department, right? And now you're talking to the guys down in the shipping department. And uh, the, the scam was selling 
two inch clear tape. So the guy picks up from the shipping department, says, shipping department, you know, John here uh, or Daryl. And, and then you say, hey, you're, you guys are still using the two inch clear tape, right? <laughs> that was the line. So this is the secret. It's like, it's like asking an office that they use eight and a half by 11 inch paper or like asking, you know, a, a podcaster, like, do you still use microphones? You know, it's like, yes, everyone uses two inch clear tape in a shipping department because it's what you use to just tape boxes. It's yeah, the yeah, clear yeah. tape that you use to pack things, It's packing tape. And so they're obviously going to say yes, but it sounds like you've already sold to them. You know, you're still using the two inch clear tape, right? We didn't say that we sold you, but then, then if they say yes, then you say, um, you know, Hey, I, I just want to, you know, like, thank you not for being a customer. Just thank you. <laughs> I want to thank you. And we're going to send out, I want to send out another box of that two inch clear tape, uh, for you guys. And I'm going to throw in a Starbucks gift card for you personally. Your name's going to be on it. This is one's for you. And I, and, and they're running me through this. And I'm like, how much is the Starbucks gift card for? I'm like a, I, I need information. I'm like obsessive about information. And so he's like, don't, don't worry about it. And I'm like, no, but like, I need to know because like, what if they ask me? Like, they, they'll never ask you. And I was like, no, but I, I have to know. Like, I just, I cannot do this job unless you tell me. And he was finally like, it's $5. <laughs> it's like, wow. So, so they, so they, you know, they do the, the Starbucks gift card thing. They get the guy to say, you know, yes, I'd like, you know, I'm still using it. Send it out. And then they send it out with an invoice. So you don't need to collect the credit card details over the phone. They send it out with the invoice and they've priced this clear tape at exactly the level that they think most accounting point, uh, accounting departments will just stamp it. So it was $500 for a box of clear tape and it cost them $5 to produce this tape. How much money did the company make? <laughs> Millions. I mean, the guys were like driving around in sports cars, like, and I ran the numbers and it was like, you know, while I was there, I, I only worked there for one day. And then like, I quit because I was like, this is a scam. I figured it out like almost immediately. But a lot of people stuck around and, like, you know, but even then I think I, I think I sold thousand dollars of clear tape. And they're just trying <laughs> to get the one sale. And the conversion rate is insane. Yeah. So, so they send out, I talked to the guys in our shipping department of the scam and, <laughs> and, and I, for, first off, hilarious. The guys don't use their own clear tape because it just falls apart. It just disintegrates. <laughs> um, it's like the worst product. Uh, they buy the stuff that gets thrown away in China, basically. Like, like if, uh, if they have manufacturing defects, that's what they buy for like 10 cents. And then they sell that for $500, which is already an order of magnitude more than you could just get from Staples. Are they are they still doing this scam? I don't know. I, I don't think so. They, they had like an F from the Better Business Bureau. And then like, <laughs> I imagine that it like dissolved. Or they probably got like all their phone numbers blocked or something. What did these guys look like? Did they look like what I think they would look like? <laughs> I imagine they actually looked exactly like the three of us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which is what I thought. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I think I think the I think the CEO had your jacket, Sam. He was wearing a black t-shirt like you. Did he drive a black Escalade? <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. No, I, I think I think they were doing like Audi R8s. I think that was like the big move. There's some guy listening like, to this that's in a shipping department that just had a holy fuck moment. He's like, We've been, <laughs> that goddamn We've been got. that tape guy who keeps calling me those gift cards. And then, and then there's like and then there's like a thousand other people who are like, so how do I get the leads to the right. shipping company? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I'm in the tape business now, boys. You're in the tape business. <laughs> <laughs> the gang sells tape. This is like one of the funniest things. I, I I ran into a guy who'd worked there a year later, and he was he came up to me. I was at a concert, and and he was like, "Oh, John, like I remember you, the tall guy. Like, how's it going?" And I was like, "Remind me where we know each other from." And he's like, "Delta Shipping." And I was like, "Oh yeah, I worked there for like a day. Like, what's up? Like, are you still there?" He's like, "No, they fired me. They fire everyone like th every three months because they need to turn people over. Because as soon as one person finds out it's a scam, they will tell everyone else. It's the same thing with like a pyramid <laughs> scheme or a Ponzi scheme. Like, you gotta like extra. You gotta like." you know, get out anyone who knows the truth and keep the blinders on everyone who's there. Because as soon as, as soon as one person figures it out, they're going to tell other people and be like, don't you think it's kind of unethical what we're doing? Or don't you think this is like, what, what if the police come? Like, would we be in trouble? You know? And then that scares everyone. And then the whole thing, the whole well is poisoned. So I'm like, oh, you got fired. Like that's, I'm sorry, man. That's tough. Like, what are you doing now? Hopefully you got like a better job. He's like, yeah, I'm selling drugs at this concert. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and he just like right I've on. never heard anyone like so proudly tell me that they're like a drug dealer but I was like okay like step know, up I'm not into that but I have some friends that are like let me make a deal that's amazing 
you uh, tell people what your YouTube channel is and also tell us why are you doing YouTube? You could be going out there building another business, but you're like us, you're creating content. So tell people what the channel is and why you do it. Yeah, I mean, basically just bored during the pandemic had always been, I mean, our first viral success at Soylent was, you know, content and content's super important for launching companies. And I'm an entrepreneur, so having a voice is very important in that equation. Um, my YouTube channel, you can find it just John Coogan search there. I also have a podcast now, powerlaw.fm, Power Law, hosted by John Coogan. Um, not an interview show. It's just kind of deep dives on these power law people and companies. These really that's a like, good name and that's a good titles. That's a Thanks, good idea. Man. Yeah. So one. it's, it's interesting. It's, uh, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I just, I really like it and, um, yeah, check it out. And I, I, the biggest problem with it is that I don't have a lot of focus. I'll talk about geopolitics. My last video was on Doug Jumuro, <laughs> like breaking down his business. Like I just, I'm all over the place, but, uh, but it's so much fun. And like, there's clearly value in what we do. Like people enjoy it, makes them happy and you meet interesting people. We got to have a great conversation because of it, you know? We appreciate you coming on. This has been really fun. You're uh, you're cool, man. We we uh, this has been awesome. We appreciate it. Hey, we, and we don't have a lot of focus either. Look, we went from scams to who are you going to yeah. vote for to guns. So, it's the dream, you know? man. It, this is I, I. This is like you your your audience. You won't be perfectly optimized. Like oh, we're like the best ever. But in terms of the lifestyle, like we all agree, like this is the way to run the content machine. Don't yeah, exactly. don't go too crazy with it. Well, thank you. We appreciate it. And uh, thanks for coming on. And that's the pod.